So today we're going to be talking about hyperparathyroidism. I'd just like to start with a little historical tidbit. So the parathyroid glands were first discovered by Richard Owen in 1852 when he performed an autopsy of the great Indian rhinoceros kept by the Zoological Society of London. So parathyroid hormone, PTH, is made by the usually four parathyroid glands that sit on top of the thyroid. And primary hyperparathyroidism is a disease that's characterized by elevated levels of PTH and traditionally by hypercalcemia as well. Primary hyperparathyroidism is one of the most common endocrine disorders. The estimated prevalence is between 0.1 to 1% in postmenopausal women. And the prevalence is about three times greater in women than men. And it is more common with increasing age. And we care about it primarily here because it's a common cause, a common secondary cause of osteoporosis. This is data looking at the prevalence over many years in the United States. And you'll see that for women, the estimated prevalence tripled uh, from the 1990s to 2010. And the rate is 233 per 100,000. The rate in men, again, is, is lower, but the rate almost tripled in men as well over that time frame. So primary hyperparathyroidism used to be a highly symptomatic disease presenting with severe hypercalcemia and these classic symptoms that we learn about, bones, stones, groans, and moans. So this is a picture of Captain Charles Martel in 1918, one of the first uh, case reports of the disease. And again, eight years later, after he'd had primary hyperparathyroidism and unfortunately suffered multiple vertebral fractures as part of the disease. So kidney stones remain the most common complication of primary hyperparathyroidism. But the classic bone disease, osteitis fibrosis cystica, is thankfully much more rare now. So this used to be manifest clinically by bone pain and radiographically by a salt and pepper appearance of the skull, tapering of the distal clavicles, subperiosteal bone resorption, and cysts and brown tumors of the long bones. Symptomatic primary hyperparathyroidism does remain common in certain areas of the world, primarily the developing world, although the more recent reports from these areas does show that it's becoming less common even here. So since the advent of the multi-channel autoanalyzer in the 1970s, it's become a disease that's primarily presenting with mild hypercalcemia and bone density changes. So this is looking at a case series of the disease over, well, from the beginning to, to more recently. And uh, as we can see, the incidence of nephrolithiasis is much lower in the more recent case report. Um, about 19% of patients presented clinically with kidney stones, but it's important to note that this is more common if imaging is performed to look for kidney stones. So this data by Walker and colleagues is from Columbia. Um, looking at some of these patients from this cohort, also at Columbia, 96 patients with primary hyperparathyroidism without a known history of nephrolithiasis were then screened with ultrasound and occult kidney stones were found in an additional 21% of patients. Hypercalciuria is becoming less common. There were no patients with the osteitis fibrosis cystica in the most recent case series, and the majority of patients are asymptomatic. So then looking at how patients present in terms of their blood tests, so um, again, these are two cohorts from Columbia, an earlier time frame and the more recent. So serum calcium has remained overall stable. So patients with primary hyperparathyroidism primarily present with mild hypercalcemia with one, within one milligram per deciliter above the upper normal limit. One of the big changes, though, in these cohorts is that vitamin D levels rose. And what was of interest is that none of the patients in the prior cohort were taking vitamin D supplements, but now more recently, everyone almost is taking vitamin D supplements. And so, again, the median vitamin D level or the uh, average vitamin D level rose across these two cohorts. And what's interesting is that PTH levels fell with this increase in vitamin D. So before the average 
uh, PTH was over two times the upper normal limit. Now it's about one and a half times the upper normal limit. Um, but associated with that, the 125 dihydroxyvitamin D levels rose. So classically, by bone density, we think of primary hyperparathyroidism as a disease affecting cortical bone. And so the distal one-third radius is typically low, while there's preservation of the trabecular skeleton with the lumbar spine and femoral neck bone density relatively good compared to healthy patients. Now, looking at this more recent cohort, what was of interest is that in the patients whose vitamin D levels were 30 nanograms per ml or above, those patients had, again, relative preservation of their one-third radius as well. So it looks like the disease is changing even more as time goes on and more patients are taking vitamin D. We don't see that classic picture by bone density of the, the low radius. So symptomatic patients with primary hyperparathyroidism should be referred for surgery. But what do we do about asymptomatic patients? So patients whose serum calcium is, uh, is not that high, they don't have the symptoms of kidney disease or bone disease. So which of those patients needs surgery? Who doesn't need surgery? Thankfully, uh, we have some data on this, but it's important to note that even though patients may not meet any specific criteria for surgery that we're gonna be discussing, Parathyroid surgery is not an inappropriate course of action, as long as there's no medical contraindications. But further looking at this, so there have been a number of international workshops to provide guidance and guidelines on uh, how to manage these patients. So the fourth international workshop was, uh, was in 2013, with those pu papers published in 2014. And then a little more recently, the American Association of Endocrine Surgeons also weighed in and gave us some guidelines. So the guidelines overviews, uh, they basically go over a lot of topics, and we're going to um, touch on a lot of these topics here. And then here are the primary papers that you can look at if you're interested. Um, again, the Fourth International Workshop Guidelines were published in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism in 2014, the Surgical Guidelines in GMS Surgery in 2016. And just going through the surgical guidelines, um, those recommendations are going to be in, in uh, the pink boxes. So looking at how we make a diagnosis and looking at the indications for genetic testing. So we're typically seeing these patients in the outpatient setting. They have mild hypercalcemia and a, an inappropriately normal or high PTH and in patients not taking any drugs known to interfere with calcium or parathyroid hormone, the most important distinction we're gonna be making is do these patients have primary hyperparathyroidism or do they have familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia, which is a, a benign disease where we can have high calcium, high PTH, but that is not managed surgically because those patients typically don't develop complications of, of the high calcium and high PTH. Uh, just one thing to note. So if you see a patient who has hypercalcemia and has a low PTH, but is otherwise doing well, you don't have a suspicion of cancer or another cause, you might want to ask them if they're taking biotin supplements because biotin interferes with some of the PTH assays and can make the PTH falsely low. So again, if you have a, a patient with a, a falsely, uh, what you suspect to be a falsely low PTH, ask them if they're taking biotin, because a lot of these assays use biotinylated antibodies, and that might be uh, lowering that level. But if you have, again, the high calcium, high PTH, you ask about family history of primary hyperparathyroidism, or look for any, um, anything that would make you suspect a syndromic form of the disease. If that is present, then you proceed to genetic testing. If that's not present, though, you're going to want to measure a urinary calcium to creatinine ratio, serum 25-hydroxyvitamin D, and estimated GFR. So this is the equation for measuring the urine calcium to creatinine ratio based on 24-hour urine calcium and creatinine and serum calcium and creatinine. So if that ratio is greater than 0.02, the patient most likely has primary hyperparathyroidism and you don't necessarily need to do a further genetic evaluation unless indicated. 
if that ratio is a little bit lower, so 0.01 to 0.02, it's felt that we're not able to fully distinguish between primary hyperparathyroidism and familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. So there, you might want to do genetic testing of the calcium sensing receptor and the associated genes to look for FHH. And it's an important distinction to make, again, because patients with FHH would not need surgery, while patients with primary hyperparathyroidism may, depending on, on uh, other factors. So if, oh, and just, just the point. So um, you do need to make sure that the patient has a replete vitamin D and good renal function in order to best interpret the urinary calcium to creatinine ratio. So if their vitamin D level is low, and they have a low urine calcium, that doesn't necessarily mean they have FHH. It just means you have to replete the vitamin D and then, um, then repeat the 24-hour collection. But if the urine calcium to creatinine ratio is low in the setting of a replete vitamin D and good renal function, then that patient most likely has FHH. And there, again, you could consider genetic testing if, um, if you're not completely sure if the patient is having symptoms and, uh, and you might be considering surgery if, if they don't have this calcium sensing receptor mutation, or you might consider genetic testing to facilitate screening of relatives. So again, if you're considering a genetic etiology to the disease, so in a patient with primary hyperparathyroidism, if they're presenting at a young age, which from the international guidelines was defined as age less than 45, if they have multiglandular disease, so two or more affected glands, if they have parathyroid carcinoma, or if they have an atypical adenoma, which is defined as having cysts or fibrous bands. So if that's the case, then you'll want to do a genetic analysis. And uh, the international guidelines give um, six genes in order of likely frequency in which to, to, uh, to analyze. Now that genetic testing is a little bit cheaper, um, I think there's a, a parathyroid panel that you can just order um, that, that has these genes in it. The surgical guidelines also mentioned another gene that's been more recently associated with the disease, the PRAD1. So obviously, if you detect a mutation, then you'll want to follow up with regular screening for other tumors if they have multiple endocrine neoplasia or hyperparathyroidism jaw tumor syndrome and then screen first-degree relatives. If they don't, then no further evaluations needed. If they didn't have any of those concerning factors, but they did have a family history, obviously you're gonna to wanna to do genetic testing as well. Um, and if they had um, findings consistent with, with a, a specific genetic disease, you'll want to do that testing first. Um, but yeah, if, uh, if they did have family members but no syndromic findings, then you do the analysis in order of likely frequency. So the surgical guidelines recommend as well genetic counseling for patients who are younger than 40 years who have any suspicious findings. So they, they back up this, uh, this recommendation, although they do say there's low quality evidence for it. So now looking at the screening and management guidelines, so the third and fourth international workshop both recommended um, surgery for patients who are less than 50 years of age. And that's due to very good evidence that shows that those patients are more likely to progress and have symptomatic disease over time. They also recommend that patients with a serum calcium greater than one milligram per deciliter above the upper lumbar limit also go on for, sur uh, for surgery. Again, that, that data um, is a little uh, less quality, but the surgical guidelines also have these recommendations, these cutoffs um, as part of their surgical um, recommendations. So again, age less than 50 years, serum calcium greater than one milligram per deciliter above normal. So now looking specifically at bones in patients with asymptomatic disease, so as we said, the bone biopsy, sorry, bone density data shows that trabecular bone is pretty good at the spine and the hip, but cortical bone at the wrist is where um, it looks like the disease affects, affects bone. And bone biopsy data seem to confirm this with relative preservation of trabecular bone, decreased cortical bone. 
So based on this, we would expect that fracture risk would be lower at vertebral sites and higher at non-vertebral sites. And so looking at data from the Mayo Clinic, so here we have um, uh, the expected rate of fractures based on healthy controls and the observed rate in patients with primary hyperparathyroidism. And so the observed rate of all fractures was higher in patients with primary hyperparathyroidism. But looking specifically at vertebral fractures, vertebral fracture risk was much higher in patients with primary hyperparathyroidism compared with healthy controls. So this is backed up by uh, data from Italy where they screened specifically for vertebral fractures with x-rays. They found that patients with symptomatic disease had a much higher risk of vertebral fractures than control healthy patients but also patients who had quote-unquote asymptomatic disease also had a much higher risk of vertebral fractures than healthy patients. And actually, most studies of fracture risk in primary hyperparathyroidism do show an increase in both vertebral and non-vertebral fracture risk. So looking at this in a different way, so at Columbia um, and other sites, there's a machine called the High Resolution Peripheral Quantitative CT, or HRPQCT, that does sort of a non-invasive bone biopsy at the distal radius and distal tibia. So you can see that there's some really good pictures that we can get there. So on the left is a, a normal, healthy patient, and on the right is a patient with osteoporosis, and you can just look and see that the, the cortices are thinner and that there's less trabecular bone there. So using HRPQCT, two groups have shown abnormalities in both cortical and trabecular bone in women with primary hyperparathyroidism. So qualitatively, uh, these are some representative samples. So a patient with a healthy bone on the right, a patient with primary hyperparathyroidism on the left, and you can just see that trabecular bone in the middle is, is uh, much less, those trabeculi are thinner. And quantitatively, we can see this as well. So this is the percentage difference in patients with primary hyperparathyroidism compared with controls. So the patients with primary hyperparathyroidism had a lower volumetric bone density, lower cortical density, and lower cortical thickness, but as well, lower trabecular bone density, lower trabecular number and thickness, and then um, uh, higher separation between the trabeculi and higher heterogeneity in the trabeculi. So all those factors are associated with worse trabecular bone. So trabecular and cortical indices were reduced at both the radius and tibia in asymptomatic patients with primary hyperparathyroidism. So more recently, we've published data looking at changes in uh, skeletal microstructure using HRPQCT up to two years after successful parathyroid surgery. And we can report that, thankfully, these parameters start to get better after surgery. So volumetric bone density, cortical parameters, and trabecular bone density, stiffness and failure load, which are estimated measures of bone strength, so all of these get better after parathyroid surgery. So that's really great news. But so with regards to the guidelines there, so now the uh, Fourth International Workshop recommends that patients who have primary hyperparathyroidism and have osteoporosis at any site or history of a fragility fracture or now evidence of a vertebral fracture if you go looking for it. And that could be by any modality, so vertebral fracture assessment, x-ray, CT, or MRI. If they have evidence of a vertebral fracture, they should be considered for parathyroid surgery. And the surgical guidelines as well um, back this up. So looking at the kidneys, so kidney stones are still the most common complication of primary hyperparathyroidism. And we can detect them by non-invasive imaging. So what happens when we go looking for them? So this is data from Italy. So here, 36.4% of patients had a clinical history of kidney stones. So they told their doctors they'd had a kidney stone in the past. But then they went and looked for kidney stones in all 140 patients here. And what they found was 55% of patients actually had kidney stones if you went looking for them. 
So um, they had also done x-rays looking for vertebral fractures in these asymptomatic patients. So they found that 22.4% of patients who were classified as asymptomatic at baseline were found to either have kidney stones, vertebral fractures, or both on imaging. So there's some relatively weak data, but data showing that a 24-hour urine analysis of biochemical stone risk factors is predictive of kidney stones in the disease and that following successful parathyroid surgery, the probability of developing new stones decreases, although not to zero, unfortunately. There is some good data showing that skeletal involvement uh, is more evident in patients with primary hyperparathyroidism when their EGFR is less than 60. So the guidelines now say that patients who have an EGFR less than 60 should be referred for parathyroid surgery. And as well, if they have a kidney stone, so you should look for one. And if they have one, then they should be referred for surgery. And if they have significant hypercalciuria plus an additional risk for kidney stones as well, that's considered an indication for surgery based on the international guidelines. The American Association of Endocrine Surgeons also um, recommend this, although they, they state it's more of a weak recommendation with low quality evidence. So looking at other aspects of the disease, so as we said, patients with that very symptomatic disease in the past presenting with very high calcium levels, they had a lot of neuropsychiatric symptoms, uh, the groans and uh, psychiatric overtones. But with the more um, asymptomatic or more mild picture that we're seeing now, Patients still complain of a lot of things, so weakness, fatigability, depression, brain fog, but it's a little nonspecific in many cases. So a lot of chronic conditions can have these symptoms. It's sort of difficult to quantitate. So unfortunately, the data that we have looking at patients with primary hyperparathyroidism before and after surgery doesn't really help us with this issue. So there have been three randomized trials looking at patients um, before and after surgery in, in terms of these neurocognitive symptoms. So one showed that parathyroidectomy doesn't necessarily improve quality of life, but prevents worsening of quality of life, but it did uh, improve psychiatric symptoms. So the other showed an improvement in quality of life, and a third didn't show any benefit whatsoever. So Unfortunately, it looks like we're still stuck here and, and don't quite have uh, some information. Then looking at cardiovascular again, so with symptomatic primary hyperparathyroidism, very high calcium levels, there are a lot of cardiovascular manifestations, but with the more mild disease we see here or these days, there have been some subtle changes found in patients with primary hyperparathyroidism compared with healthy patients. So sudden abnormalities have been seen in blood pressure vascular reactivity, left ventricular hypertrophy, and carotid intimal thickness. But really, the functional significance of these findings is unknown. And again, whether they're fixed by parathyroid surgery is also unclear. So there have been a, a number of um, small studies, and not necessarily randomized controlled trials. Um, a, a recent meta-analysis of 15 of these studies did find a small decrease in left ventricular, left ventricular mass of 12% following a parathyroid surgery, but there was no improvement consistently in other parameters. So the Fourth International Workshop just said there's still not enough data to recommend surgery for patients with neurocognitive and cardiovascular disease based on the data that we have currently. The surgeons, on the other hand, uh, made a strong recommendation that they recommend parathyroid surgery for patients with neurocognitive and or neuropsychiatric symptoms attributable to uh, primary hyperparathyroidism, although acknowledge that it's low quality evidence. They don't really say in their guidelines how to make sure that it's attributable to the disease, but this was their strong recommendation. And then they also made a weak recommendation that parathyroidectomy be offered to patients with cardiovascular disease who may benefit from mitigation of potential cardiovascular sequelae other than hypertension. 
And then they also made a weak recommendation that non-traditional symptoms of muscle weakness, functional capacity, abnormal sleep patterns be considered in this decision for surgery. Um, but there is insufficient evidence for, for other non-traditional features, um, gastrointestinal reflux and fibromyalgia. So looking at recommendations for calcium intake, so a lot of patients uh, ask about calcium and vitamin D. So there's really no data to support a dietary restriction of calcium in patients with primary hyperparathyroidism. And many have been told, erroneously, to restrict calcium. But di low dietary calcium has been shown in, in many cases to stimulate PTH secretion, which can, can overall make the disease worse. So there was a prospective trial where patients with low dietary calcium intake were then supplemented with 500 milligrams of calcium. And here, there was no significant increase in the serum calcium after four and 12 weeks. There was a, an improvement in PTH levels, which we like to see. And also, there was an improvement in femoral neck bone density after a year of calcium. So calcium is beneficial in these patients and we should not be telling them to restrict. Then looking at vitamin D, uh, a recent meta-analysis of 10 studies showed that giving vitamin D before surgery produced no significant change in serum calcium despite increasing vitamin D, as you would expect. Although in this meta-analysis, they found that five patients did develop worsening hypercalcemia which uh, made the investigators stop taking vitamin D, but no patient developed hypercalcemic crisis. There was a double-blind randomized control trial in Denmark that showed that vitamin D3 to 2,800 units versus placebo was able to significantly decrease PTH levels, increase bone density, and decrease bone turnover markers, so all things that we would like to see. And thankfully here, there was no difference in adverse events between the two groups, and no difference in any time point in serum or urinary calcium levels between groups. So the uh, international workshop guidelines state that calcium intake should follow the national guidelines. 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels should be maintained over 20 nanograms per ml, but starting off slow with levels of uh, vitamin D 600 to 1,000. Um, the, these guidelines were published before that randomized controlled trial. And they do recommend monitoring serum and urine calcium with vitamin D. The surgical guidelines as well state that um, we should give patients calcium intake following guidelines and that patients before parathyroid surgery can uh, safely begin vitamin D supplementation. So more recently, we've seen patients with an even more subtle presentation of primary hyperparathyroidism. So patients that we've noticed have an increased PTH, but normal serum calcium. So normal calcemic primary hyperparathyroidism was first recognized at the third international workshop, but there they didn't give any diagnostic criteria or management recommendations. And unfortunately, it's still somewhat of a new field. There is still no clear evidence to guide physicians regarding management, but the Fourth International Workshop did try and make a consistent definition of the disease so that research could be more standardized moving forward, and did give some expert recommendations to help guide physicians as to who um, should or should not go for parathyroid surgery. So regarding the diagnosis, so by definition, patients have a high PTH, but they should also have a normal albumin-adjusted serum calcium and normal ionized calcium. So sometimes patients with traditional hypercalcemic primary hyperparathyroidism may occasionally have a normal calcium, but those patients don't have normal calcemic disease. Um, so for normal calcemic disease, the, the values should be normal consistently. And then here, it's really important to rule out secondary causes of high PTH. So the most common is vitamin D deficiency. And the guidelines say that the minimum goal level should be 20 nanograms per ml. But many experts think that it's better to have the levels up at least 30 nanograms per ml to be more secure in your diagnosis. And it's interesting as well, sometimes patients with uh, hypercalcemic disease who are very vitamin D deficient might 
become hypercalcemic with, with vitamin D uh, repletion. So that's important to, to differentiate between those two. So we know that PTH rises as EGFR falls. And so in order to make a diagnosis of normal calcemic primary hyperparathyroidism, you really need to have an EGFR greater than 60 cc's per minute. A number of medications have been shown to increase PTH levels, so thiazide or loop diuretics, lithium, bisphosphonates, and denosumab. Whether hypercalciuric, how hypercalciuria causes high PTH is a little bit controversial, but at least it is still in the guidelines to exclude that as a secondary cause of hyperparathyroidism. And then any gastrointestinal disorder causing calcium malabsorption. So the guidelines recommended monitoring calcium and PTH annually and checking a DEXA every one to two years. And so if there was progression of the disease to the hypercalcemic form, there you could follow the guidelines. If there was progression of the disease otherwise, so worsening bone density or fracture or kidney stone or nephrolithiasis, in that case you could just pursue surgery. So there's been some more data out since the guidelines um, were published, but um, it does look like bone density increases in patients with normal calcemic disease with alendronate, similar to what we see in patients with hypercalcemic disease, although the study was um, much smaller than the patients with, with hypercalcemic primary hyperparathyroidism. Unfortunately, it looks like imaging studies are less likely to localize a parathyroid lesion in normal calcemic disease. And this may be because there's a much higher percentage of multiglandular disease in patients with normal calcemic primary hyperparathyroidism compared with hypercalcemic. So one study found that uh, the prevalence of multiglandular disease in normal calcemic was 13% versus 7% in hypercalcemic. And another found this difference to be even greater. So 45% of patients with normal calcemic disease had multiglandular disease versus just 9% with hypercalcemic disease. So there, the normal calcemic patients had over an eight-fold risk of multiglandular disease. And obviously, this, this complicates the surgery. Um, you can't necessarily do a minimally invasive parathyroidectomy in these patients. So it requires much more counseling. As well, um, thankfully, we do have some data that after surgery, if, uh, if they undergo it, patients with normal calcemic disease do have a similar improvement in bone density as patients with hypercalcemic disease. So I just want to touch on this briefly, just because it's of interest to me, but obviously there's very little data here. So now that we're doing more imaging studies, we've been finding some incidental parathyroid nodules at the time of imaging or, or during a surgery. There are less than 50 cases of this reported in the literature as of now. And the majority of these cases are biochemically silent, so serum calcium and PTH levels are normal. And I'm actually following a woman who has a, a 1.8 centimeter parathyroid lesion, normal calcium, normal PTH, normal bone density, no kidney stones. And so I think this is going to be something that we're seeing more and more, but really we don't have any data on monitoring or, or other management of this. So it's something that we're going to have to address coming up soon. Then looking at, at medical management of the disease, so observation, what uh, medical treatments do we have? So the natural history, um, the longest data that we have is from Columbia. So here patients were followed up to 15 years without parathyroid surgery. So the one thing is that serum calcium levels did sort of trend up over time, but otherwise the other biochemical parameters did remain pretty stable. Then looking at bone density over 15 years, I mean, it's pretty remarkable that lumbar spine bone density sort of remained relatively stable over 15 years. But on average, bone density at the femoral neck and the distal radius did decline between years 10 and 15. So 37% of patients did develop one or more indications for surgery during 15 years of monitoring, so either kidney stones, hypercalcemia, or low bone density. But if, uh, it depends on if you're a glass half full, glass half empty type person. So you could say 63% of patients didn't 
develop an indication for surgery during this time frame. So when do we use medical treatment for these patients? So when surgery is indicated but medically contraindicated or the patient does not wish to have surgery. And so what do we use? It depends on whether the patient has hypercalcemia or low bone density. Um, so it's important to note that sinicalcid is the only approved agent for therapy of hypercalcemia in patients with primary hyperparathyroidism in the United States and the European Union. And then a few other drugs have been studied. This is a, showing an overview of what the studies have shown. So estrogen really just maintains biochemical and bone density parameters, which may be what you want for a patient. Raloxifene did decrease serum calcium a little bit, but really had no effect on PTH or bone density. As you would expect, alendronate really improved bone density in patients with primary hyperparathyroidism, like we see with osteoporosis, but unfortunately it didn't have any effects on calcium or PTH. So sinicalcid, again, it really improves serum calcium, but unlike what we see with renal hyperparathyroidism, it doesn't really change PTH levels as much. And unfortunately, it didn't do anything for bone density. So there is one small trial using a combination of sinicalcid and alendronate, and there the um, effects we saw were, were additive between the two, so it, it did both. It decreases serum calcium, um, PTH to a lesser extent, but really improves bone density. Um, just of note, again, with alendronate, um, we have bone density data, but unfortunately, we don't have fracture data. So here are the recommendations for the fourth international workshop was uh, for hypercalcemia, you want to use sinicalcid. And to improve bone density, you want to use a bisphosphonate. So really the best data we have is for alendronate, but I typically use whatever the patient prefers. And then to reduce serum calcium and increase bone density, you might want to do combination treatment with sinicalcid and a bisphosphonate, but really we don't have a lot of great data for that. So the surgeons sort of disagree with this. So they, they say that operative management is more effective and cost-effective than either long-term observation or pharmacologic therapy. So looking at surgery, so the uh, surgical approaches, a minimally invasive parathyroidectomy with intraoperative PTH monitoring versus a full bilateral exploration. And thankfully nowadays, the minimally invasive parathyroidectomy with, with this intraoperative PTH monitoring, um, we have cure rates of 97 to 99%. With this, we do have to do some kind of preoperative localization, but there's a lot of options out there. So the ideal localization study depends on what is best in your local institution, as well as the, pre uh, the preference of the surgeon. So my mentor, John Bilizikian, would always quote, John Dopman, who would say that the most important preoperative localization study in PTH and primary hyperparathyroidism is to localize the surgeon. So the surgeons as well recommend that uh, patients be referred to an expert clinician to decide which imaging studies to perform. And they recommend getting an ultrasound in all patients to look both for parathyroid disease and concomitant thyroid disease. Because um, so obviously that would change the management if there is a thyroid nodule that turns out to be thyroid cancer. So thankfully we have pretty good data that after surgery, biochemical parameters, your risk of kidney stones, uh, bone density, and bone microarchitecture all normalize or return towards normal. And so... Um, if we aren't going to be doing surgery, the monitoring guidelines recommend looking at bone density uh, every one to two years, and then looking at uh, the vertebral, um, looking for vertebral fractures if a patient is presenting with pain, and then annual monitoring of EGFR and looking at a stone risk profile or um, abdominal imaging if the patient has concern for stones. And then the indications for surgery during monitoring are similar to those if, if, uh, as they're presenting. So there's a lot of um, information both for and against surgery or medical management. And we do need to import, um, consider both surgery versus man medical management in patients. Um, 
More recently, there's been some data sort of looking at a, a non-invasive, quote unquote, parathyroidectomy, so ultrasound guided microwave ablation. So that may further tip the scales, but we need a lot more data on that to, to make a, a judgment. So here the guidelines for surgery have been uh, revised. And non-surgical management may be appropriate for patients who don't meet surgical criteria or if there are contraindications for surgery. But surgery would also be appropriate for patients who don't meet surgical criteria if, if they want it and there are no medical contraindications.